Tan fans, this is uh, Connor Gallagher, your publisher. Thank you for being with us today. We have a, a great guest, Father Francis Bethel, and uh, he's a Benedictine out at Clear Creek Abbey. And we wanted to talk to him today about a number of things, about the importance of St. Benedict in our, in our history of our church and in our world today. And we'll also talk to him a little bit about a book that he'll have coming out with Tan you know, in the, in the future. Um, but mostly today we want to talk about the influence of St. Benedict and the, uh, the Benedictine way of life on our world. So, you know, um, I want to begin, Father, thank you, by the way, thank you for being here with us. It's a real pleasure to have you. My pleasure. Yep. So we're going to get to know you a little bit better later on in this conversation, but I'd like to begin with this, this little story. So recently I had my uh, management team up in the mountains doing a strategic retreat, right? So we're up and, and it gets a little goofy. The guys late at night get a little weird. Uh, and we worked hard all day. And so we're playing at night a little bit, but these guys ended up playing this game on the whiteboard uh, that we had for our strategic planning. And they were trying to figure out who was the most influential musician of all time, right? So they were going through every possible musician you can think of, like, who was the most influential? And then, of course, it devolved into, you know, uh, what is what is uh, influential mean? You know, you can be influential in all these different ways. Uh, so are you talking about, you know, uh, Bob Dylan? Are you talking about the Beatles? What are you talking about? So these guys got weird. I went to bed, went to sleep. They stayed up like half the night debating this. And it was pretty funny. So at breakfast, we went over, you know, who was the most influential musician. But, you know, in preparing to talk to you, I actually thought of that. Because if we were to play that same game, Father, with the most influential saints throughout history, there is no doubt that Benedict would be on the short list. Okay, he'd be on the short list. So my question for you to begin this is why? What makes this guy from 1,500 years ago so influential uh, throughout the whole history of the church? You want me to respond to that? Yeah. <laughs> Well, we got plenty of time. Okay. Uh, first of all, he came at a time towards civilization was falling apart in the West. He brought um, stability. He brought these cultures, these frameworks of life with um, order to truth. I mean, the, the deep truth, people were getting lost in the normal, normal economic life, but all sorts of human ways also. Things were falling apart. The barbarians were coming in the sixth century. So that, first of all, he was a providential figure. Monastic life in general was a, a grouping together a vital Christian human truths and life. And he put together also his first one to really write a true Benedictine, a true, excuse me, monastic rule. Usually before St. Basil, for example, just kind of gave moral precepts and they're just kind of customs. He really put them together that could hold up with, um, you know, bringing in a lot of practical things that, that no one had ever written down before. So, and, uh, so in this wild world, just kind of centered, uh, kind of gathered around monasteries. So historically, that way, that the monasteries were kind of the um, reserves of civilization, Christian life and thought, and towns grew around them. So that way. And then um, through the centuries, we just need that, you know, and um, his rule, just the, the, so very well set up, um, humanly, you might say, is a natural foundation and basis for what he had in mind was supernatural life. He wasn't, he didn't have in mind saving Western civilization directly or anything. He had, right. he had right. mind leading souls to heaven. But the, he built up the, he um, when used, set up framework and a life that, um, was stable, like I said, but like family life, Father Abbott, a real father, brotherhood, living around the liturgy, the prayer of the church, um, Lexio Divina, just things that are forever, you know, and um, that we all need. So today, so that, so the big Benedictine centuries were 
six through 12th or so, when the towns started developing then and the Dominicans and friars went out into the towns and the Jesuits, you know, uh, 16th century, trying to get back the Catholic faith and uh, even less, more, even more free from the home base and the liturgy, but they, we needed that to find teachers. But behind that, you need, I think, monasteries to, they, they held civilization together and gave this great basis of prayer and recollection and deep penetration of the Christian truths in civilization, in life. So behind this great movement of the Dominicans, Franciscans, and the Jesuits, there was that centuries of Benedictine life, and it continued underneath. And maybe now we need it in a special way again, maybe to group back together, hold on to the great truths, and to live them instead of just, you know, in the books or in on the media, which is a you know, there's so much scholarship now possible. We need this life of prayer. So those are some basic things. Um, yeah. Pardon. That's great. Now let me let me ask you a, a oh, yeah. Let me ask you a crazy question here, Father. Um, if if Saint Benedict rose from the dead today, right, and he saw our world, uh, and he's seen a crazy world before, right, because he was in a crazy world. Yeah. Uh, but he saw our world. What would he What would he think about this world? What would he say to the world? And then what would he do? What would he do in today's world? Well, I know what he'd do. No, what he's, go ahead, though. Is that your question? That's it. No, that's it, yeah. Yeah. You ask big, big, big questions. Uh, <laughs> first of all, you say, let's live our monastic life. That's for sure. There's no doubt about that. Continue like we've done, you know, make it better, more intense, but, you know, not to adapt, you know, in the measure you need to, okay, but you hold on to your essential of your life. That's what we, that's what a monk can do for the world. There's no doubt about that. That's what he'd say. Okay, we'll start Monte Casino. We'll get Monte Casino, Subiaco going, which they are. I'm not denying that they're still monasteries, but they, he said, get your monasteries in shape. And what do you say to the world? Uh, I, I, I don't know what to say there, except, you know, you have to start with God and work out the details, but, and a culture that, um, a culture that cultivates our gaze towards God. That's what the monasteries are. So that's, he would know how to make a monastery. That's for sure. He might not have the message what to do with the internet and all that exactly. So yeah, sorry, that's about all. Oh, that's good, that's good. So um, what's it like to be a monk? <laughs> um, well, um, I never could have, one reason I became a monk, I knew I could never achieve recollection maybe at all, or very little as I can as a monk. Living a monk, everything centered around Christ, everything around the liturgy, you know, you just naturally, you're in God's presence, you can't, and you're deepening um, your life of prayer, deepening the Christian truths, and living the liturgy we do, just getting, going through them every year, like, like you can hardly do outside of Dominican monastery, almost, or outside of monastery, to live the liturgy like we do. Also, you know, on the natural level, so healthy, we're out in the country, we work outside, great fraternal family life, you know, values that uh, we need very much today that you can find in a monastery, that e even a more healthy natural life, I think very much, yeah, we, we make our, of course we, it's kind of like a, a medieval manor, you know, in the ninth century, something we do everything ourselves, make our own clothes, cook our own food, make our own, you know, grow our own vegetables. We can never like make our own ketchup, mayonnaise, everything, you know? So the whole thing has its, and the complimentary, the different brothers, very beautiful, very beautiful fraternal relationships. So that's, and you know, able to really, um, the silence, the peace, recollection, reading, you're doing what you're doing. You know, yeah. No, that's really good. That's really good. Now, I know that Clear Creek Abbey has, is beautiful, um, and it's known as kind of old school, right? So that's kind of how people know it, uh, whether it's Talking traditional about liturgy. Monastery? Yeah, yes, yes, you're yeah. a monastery. So it's kind of known as old school. And you can just look at this beautiful website you have, by the way, and just see farming, you know, working with your hands and praying. So, you know, and I know that, 
a lot of religious communities, Father, are trying to kind of return to the charism of their founders. So, so yeah, that's not just unique to the Benedictines. But, you know, talk to me about how you guys are old school. You mentioned some of it, but how's this different from a typical monastery these days? And, you know, what is people's reaction? They go and they see what you're doing. It is so different from what they're exposed to. So just talk to me about how your monastery and your way of life is a little unique from perhaps, you know, others that, um, you know, have, have kind of dominated the scene over the last 60, 70 years. Well, I don't have much experience of other monasteries, really. Uh, I know some, but I can't compare detail. One thing, very important among Benedictines anyway, our congregation is more focused on liturgy and um, spiritual life. We don't have schools or or um, or parishes, so we really are focused on our life of prayer uh, and the liturgy. We um, we we are a, I think kind of a haven for people a little bit both, as I say, humanly and supernaturally, people like coming here for the peace and, you know, getting away from the crazy world. And I think um, without I'm not bragging or anything, I hope, but that was my experience when I first went to the monastery too. These, there are some men here, just a great witness. They're at their business with God. They know what they're doing. They're they're serious about the faith so it's a very good witness for the faith um we're when um our abbot uh jean roy in 1965-66 right after vatican ii there was a reunion as there is every four years in rome of the benedictine abbots and they had a an audience with uh saint paul the sixth pope paul the sixth and um, paul gave a talk and then you got to greet the um the holy father each one each abbot greet him for like 10 seconds and our abbot says holy father they want to change our life a lot of these abbots want uh to change our life um do you want us to change our life he goes and holy father the pope said no you must keep your tradition but i want you to open wide your guest house people really need an oasis today where they can find god in the silence in the prayer so that's what we try to do that's our that's part of benediction life anyway that um, receiving very hospitality is an important part in the rule and in tradition. That's a witness they can't get quite as well. You know, they can see very good priests, good teaching, but there's a, a life before God that they, they can find in a monastery. It's hard to find elsewhere. Paul VI also, I can't remember it well enough, when he um, consecrated the church, Monte Cassino, which got bombed in World War II, was rebuilt when he named uh, Benedict XVI patron of Europe. And that's what I, we were talking about earlier. He's one of the major fathers of Christian Europe. Um, but he talked about the witness Benedictines have just by living our life. People want to see what's going on, and they enter a little bit and are kind of charmed away by the beauty of the life there. So um, we are, of course, so other Benedictine monasteries, and then like the Carmelites, or I think what I was saying earlier about we try to use, I'd say the created world a little more than Carmelites, for example, Carmelite friars, nuns also, with a family life, try to be in a beautiful place, beautiful church, things that lift you up, help lift you up, this uh, natural framework. So the difference there with uh, Carmelites, so, and then we're stable more than the others I was mentioning, the, the different friars, uh, Dominicans or Franciscans, they're more, which we need, obviously, teaching, going out, while we kind of receive the people come into our home and live our life. That's our witness, really. Come and live our life with us. You know, basically, we have oblates that that's basically what they do. They try to live the Benedictine life with us. They're part of a monastery from the outside. And then, of course, guests. So we have a big guest house and um, guest quarters, and they work with the monks and eat with the monks, the men do, and see priests if they like. And But the main thing is to live our life, go to the liturgy, just get a feel for it. it. Helps you realize God's presence. I think more, more aware of His presence, and it that'll work from there to want to serve Him more. So, okay. Well, let me ask you this: What's your uh, favorite part of the day, and your least favorite part of the day? <laughs> My favorite part of the day. Uh, that's I like a lot of them. 
which I personally, I, I, I teach theology. I enjoy that very much, but I enjoy it. I enjoy the choir, enjoy recreation, even enjoy the meals. The meals are great. You know, it's a very, they're in silence with somebody reading, very liturgical, really. Uh, so the worst part of the day, I don't have a worst part. There's uh, sometimes hard to get out of bed, like for anybody, you know, and I'm tired in the morning sometimes, you know, uh, the early morning. I do, it's a great time for Matt and we have our, we have the divine office first thing in the morning, about, about five o'clock in the morning. It's a great moment to really be able to take, pay attention to the Psalms and pray them, but it's a little harder physically, I suppose, sometimes. So I don't have a bad part. Yeah, That's they're all good. Good, good, really are. Recreation's great too, great monks. They're a great bunch of guys. We know each other pretty well, you know, um, being together all the time, every day. So we really have a really good time every day in recreation. We just got out of recreation before I came up here. That's so I don't have a bad time. Yeah. That's good. That's good. All right. Well, what do you think people most misunderstand about being a Benedictine? I mean, you've got to encounter misconceptions. What are those usually? Personally, I don't encounter that much, but of course, why are you guys there when you could do, you know, you've had this education, you should be out te teaching or something, you know, so yeah. much. You, so I'm sure that bothers a lot of people and people don't understand, you know, uh, that hadn't, it helps if you've been there, but that would be the main thing, certainly. Of course, the old things, why don't you get married or whatever sort of things, you know, that sort of thing. But as far as among uh, Catholics, um, why, you know, what's. Well, like I'm saying, um, first of all, the witness and just we need that, not just reading books, but having experience. So that gives opportunity for experience to people. And also, I think I mean, this is church teaching. We kind of open up the window to heaven a little bit so light and grace can enter in for the world. Therese Child Jesus, of course, very famously said, she, you know, the Carmelites or the contemplaries are heart of the church, that the workers you know, the missionaries need that basis of prayer behind them. And we hear that a lot. I hear a lot from um, people more out there, priests, I'm thinking of particularly. And I haven't seen the missionaries much since we've been here in France. We saw them quite a bit. And they'd always say us, you know, we feel your prayer, how much we need you. So that's the main thing, that why behind the walls. I think I've said some, you know, our, for our own spiritual life, which is for the good of the church. Every person who makes one step forward, the whole church moves forward. I hope um, Thomas Merton had an, an image of we're like a tree in the night, no noise, no movement, but it freshens the air, purifies the air. And we do have, we're, you know, monastic life's an important presence that there's God above all, you know, God alone in a way. That's how we can find our happiness. And our, I mean, they see monks are happy, you know, just by life with God. That's a good sign. So, we have a really important witness there. Well, one last question about uh, St. Benedict and the history before I kind of get a little bit more into you. Um, so, you know, if you, had a, if you had a crystal ball and could see what your monastery was going to be looking like in 100 years from now and what the Benedictine order in general was doing for the world 100 years from now, and, and the Benedictine history 100 years isn't very long, right? I mean, that's like looking down... Down. Next yeah, next week. It's long know. for me. Go ahead. So um, for a hundred years, long for you, but not for Benedict <laughs> at this point. So you know, uh, what do you think your abbey and the, the the order is doing for the church way down the road? Because you know, I ask this because the church is in need. Obviously, it's always in need, um, and the seems like throughout the centuries the Benedictine way of life has been that kind of rock solid foundation that whatever the church is facing, the culture's facing, that stability, that rule, it's always kind of the bedrock of religious life. So fast forward a hundred years, what do you what do you see happening with the with your order and your community? Well, I don't know. I hope it'd be good if monasteries spread. We're trying to make foundation ourselves fairly soon. Um, more monasteries that can be sent. Uh, we've had several young men enter here from seminary that are delighted. You know, not that they, well, they just found more, they found a spiritual life. They were having trouble in the seminary and families are moving out here. They need monasteries more than, more than ever in a way, you know, in this kind of crazy world. So 
we have real problems, you know, there's hard for our life in many ways. They, you know, um, the media, you know, what are we going to do? That's a real, dis how to work with media. That's, uh, so I don't know what's going to be a hundred years from now with all that. We're very strict on telephones, internet and all that. So those are things I wouldn't know. We have to discipline that. Everybody does, but monks particularly. I'm sure, you know, change, change homes, but also change monastic life, telephone. All of a sudden, the outside world's in there. So that's that's a long time ago. And we've, been, we've made a lot of progress since then, so to speak. So those things are uh, my one abbot I know. I mean, it was our first founder of where I'm from, Fogombo in France. First time he saw a car inside, he was from Solem, another monastery. Um, he saw a car. Where, who let that car in here? And somebody goes, Father, we just bought that car. That's ours. He goes, oh, that's the end of monastic life, you know. So he might have been right. I mean, I'm sure that we're a little bit. So we have to watch that very much. Definitely. That's a not because that can pull you out. Like we all know cell phones and all that. We don't have anything like that, obviously, but that pulls on people. In fact, we have a telephone. We don't watch television or anything. So we have cars. We can go to town easier, which is very helpful. But I'm just um, saying those are things many just have to deal with. So anyway, I would say we have to keep our life, the essential of our life, whatever happens. And that's the good we can do for the world. And hopefully more monasteries. And also the prayer around, we, you know, our prayers around the liturgy, the church prayer. That's so important for people to enter into that. That's how the church teaches us to pray, teaches about God, you know way you can't learn in books so we have to hold on to that so i the best thing we do is not change our life we can always be better monks and sh some adaptations of course we say the rosary saint benedict didn't have a rosary you know etc cetera, etc cetera. but hold on to our life so i hope it doesn't change much okay that's what we can do for the world that's beautiful it's beautiful all right let's let's if you can talk about yourself now a little bit father you know I, i'm going to ask you because we've covered a lot about Benedict and the Benedictine presence in the world, but uh, I want to know more about you. So I'm going to ask you about John Sr. in a minute. Um, I don't know if your answer to the first question will get you there, but why did you become a monk? Um, so why did I become a monk or how? Uh, how about both? Huh? Yeah. Both. Um, um, my personal, uh, let's take the how, and in the middle of that, I'll put in the why, I guess. So I was at University of Kansas, and the whole movement there, which he's alluding to, Mr. Gallagher, and um, uh, conversions. And when I, uh, so I was Protestant, reading St. Saint, Saint Augustine, his confessions, and I wanted to be like that. I want to be a Catholic like he was, and I wanted to live that, you know, when he converted, he gave himself totally to God, you know, not getting married anyway, I mean it that way. So I wanted that. Um, well, um, Mr. Senior had, um, he had discovered Fogumbo in France. Now, uh, I have to explain what that is. That's our monastery in France. I will, we we'll probably talk about that in a minute here. But I'd also, I'm sorry to interrupt, Pardon? you know, most of our readers or listeners are not going to have any idea who John Sr. is. Yeah. So give some yeah, perspective yeah, on who he is. It's a great story. Yeah. So listeners, listen up, because this this guy is an unsung hero. Uh, and Father Bethel's the, I guess, the world-class expert on John Sr. So please kind of <laughs> give, give some backstory to who John Sr. was. Okay. Um, so... Uh, do I show the whole IHP program? Or are we going to come to that? Or should I just say a little no, bit here? It's up to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for first point, John Sr. was a teacher at the University of Kansas who had a great influence. And uh, we can talk about all the teaching he did and how it worked. But let's just say for the moment, a lot of conversions around him to the Catholic Church and to God and Christ. And he was, um, he saw the importance of monastic life, particularly Benedictine life to get back Christian culture. He wrote two books on Christian culture. He just thought for the faith in the normal order of providence, you need Christian culture behind it. And Benedict was the mad, the patron of that. And Benedictine monasteries are kind of uh, centers for that. So very big on Benedictine monastic life and encouraged that his students look into it. And he found he wanted a monastery, like I was saying, that had more focus on liturgy and spiritual life, less on schools and parishes. Nothing wrong with that, but he just wanted to go to the, the first first. 
and found Fogumbo in France. So um, uh, two of his students were going to Europe uh, to look into vocation a little bit and get a little, they were converts, get a little more uh, deeper experience of deeper Catholic culture. And he encouraged them to go to Fogumbo. They, they went around a year, a room a little while, Italy, and then they went to Fogumbo and they loved it. They spent the winter there. They spent seven, eight months. One of them entered. And so after that, John Sr. every year would, per, for four or five years, uh, had a little team he would send over and would spend the whole winter there, like eight or nine months till Easter. And every year, one or two would enter. I was the third year. The, so, mm -hmm. But the first one really showed us we could do it. Stu Ashton, who did not stay finally, he entered Fogombo. And we saw you can do it. American can do it here. So there was a one entered the next year, and then I entered the next year. There were three that entered. So it just grew and grew. When, by the way, when we entered, um, the idea of John Senior's mind was to come back someday and start a monastery near Lawrence, where KU is, for the, to, or at least come back and form some guys around there and get a monastery going. Uh, when we entered Fogombo, the, the Master of Novices, who later became abbot, told us, you're not entering here to make foundation. You're entering here to be a monk here. You know, maybe we'll make a foundation some there if the Lord leads us there. So we really went there to become monks there. So that's materially, in a way. Um, things that attracted me, of course, it's so beautiful. And once again, this healthy, natural life, you know, everything, baking bread, the monastery, 12th century, all in stone. You know, people have been praying there for a thousand years almost, you know. All, and the, just the, the joy of the monks, the beautiful liturgy, beautiful church. Uh, myself, um, I was really attracted to contemplative life without knowing what that word meant necessarily, but the finding Christ, to getting to know Christ, and where everything I do would have meaning. It has meaning for everybody, but it's more obvious in a monastery in a way. And you know, I wonder, uh, path to heaven, you know, all I have to do is go forward on this line, uh, I'll get there type of thing. And I knew I would never regret it, you know, uh, for eternity if I did this. So those were kind of my thoughts some. Um, and to be able to really think about God all the time without any distraction was my, yeah, my personal motivation. So there you go. That was in 1975. I entered the monastery. Okay. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's very good. Um, one of your books was John Senior and the Restoration of Realism. So go a little bit further, Father, into what John Senior's method was in teaching this realism to, I guess, a bunch of relativists. Uh, you know, in especially in the 60s and 70s, and 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 how that influence has. You know, there. I think there was a list in your book of you know, the people that John Sr. influenced. And it's quite remarkable. I mean, it's these leaders throughout all industries. Um, and I'm, I meet people all the time who live kind of extraordinary lives, and they say that John Sr. was a major influence. So tell our audience a little bit more about what that's all about. Okay. One thing, um, it's amazing right now. It's, I mean, generations didn't know John Senior at all, how much influence he's having in different colleges and a lot of individuals too, but I'm particularly aware of colleges that are uh, being formed, being started with him as a major inspiration, also in the middle of a, you know, a department or a few teachers trying to do something like they did. Um, to go way back, so John Senior was a pagan, a Christian background, but not baptized and got in, um, uh, through his literary studies, got into seeing, he uh, did his doctorate on the occult behind modern literature. He was, and it was part of his, re, you know, his own personal quest for truth, for God, if he could, but found all these authors behind modern literature, uh, particularly uh, 19th century France, Baudelaire, yeah, um, Mallarmé, the, less, the other names are less known. So he got into that and and then he got into Eastern thought, and um, he read. He was reading an author that mentioned Thomas Aquinas and Augustine all the time. An Eastern author who lived in the West, talking about Hinduism, but trying to reach out to Westerners. So quoting these Western authors, so he decides to read Saint Thomas. Myself, a year later, he's a Catholic. You know, <laughs> very quickly, amazing. So, and um, 
he moved, he was at, he was teaching at Cornell at the time, moved out West, then immediately afterwards to Wyoming, then eventually came to KU. So, um, he himself was a man of literature mainly. So he, he knew in his bones, the importance of literature of experiential type learning rather than just abstract learning, like just philosophy. Mm-hmm. So he saw the knee. He, one thing that brought that to it, brought home that home to him was when he started trying to bring St. Thomas into his teaching, no echo with the students. And he figured out after a while they didn't have the background he had. He had a great uh, experience to work on a ranch in South Dakota every summer on horseback. He had a great experience of nature and then he had wonderful uh, literary culture from his mother. He went to Columbia, you know, and then Cornell, or at least he taught at Cornell. Great, that's what he taught literature. So he saw the importance of these um, background before really entering into deep abstract thinking, the, the contact of reality, the love of reality, the wonder, the emotions and imagination uh, connected to reality and lifted up towards great realities. I remember, so, I remember Father, like uh, in the book, you talk about how he famously said, water is wet and fire is warm. And it's, you know, he was reflecting as a full, full-blown full academic on his early life. He, he became a, a dude ranch panned very young, but he, ha- he encountered nature in a way that a lot of the city kids never do. But it was, it was those basic contacts with reality that, that, that it, was, it was in his memory so that when he's dealing with, you know, high fluting relativistic philosophy from Ivy League professors, he had that in his bones, um, and it brought him back to where he saw the realism in Aquinas or other people. So, you know, that's a that's a fascinating thing. And so that's, that's I guess that's why I'm trying to raise my kids on a small little farm with chickens and goat, goats and yeah. grow our, some of our own food. I'm realizing that, too. I have a lot of friends are, you know, really trying to get back to working with their kids out in the country. With them. So... Um, John Sr. then with two other professors, like-minded, sort of this inter- integrated humanities program. The idea, a basic idea was uh, most of the kids coming to college had not really had a good, healthy, what should be in high school type education. And so connection with reality and this good literature that cultivates and compensates for lack to of, of experience and love and wonder and chivalry and all these great ideals. That, um, that literature can help build up so easily. So they wanted to uh, give that foundation a two year program. So you'd have time to slowly, leisurely read the great books in chronology and mainly uh, imaginative books. I mean, literature more than philosophy, figuring the students weren't quite ready for that. The first year they did a little Aristotle and they finally let it go. We didn't read a Thomas. We did, like I said, little Augustine confessions. So, and it was just a great success. They were great teachers. They all were like-minded. In fact, so the movement of conversions, even one of the teachers converted. He was an Anglican. So that was, you know, I converted before he did. So, <laughs> so anyway, however, and the teach the uh, there were three or four graduate assistant, assistant them probably many graduate students that helped out. They didn't convert them, but they did at least two of them later converted. So it was a big. It was a nice movement. And a lot of besides. So there are seven monks here six and a half, one kind of was around the program, never took it uh, here. They went through the program and there's, you know, probably 15 other priests and religious to Benedict nuns that I know of are still in France. They didn't come back. They had their, they entered in France also and they're still there, but they're doing very well. So, um, so that's, um, that's their big theme, right? The restoration of culture and the importance of the imaginative part of culture to the the whole lot which includes very much family life you know games you play just your act your recreations your activities and yeah and so they very much um they made tapes about family you know homeschooling and so senior uh so they taught college but he, most of his students became high school teachers because that's where the work was supposed to be done or earlier you know so I hope that gives some idea. It does, it does. 
Yeah, thank you, Father. That's it's a really amazing story. So I, I I hope our listeners check out John Cena and the Restoration of Realism. I mean, it's it's a fun read, and uh, it's it's almost hard to believe how how much impact this one guy had reading literature with people. You know, it's amazing, and it's still going on. Like I say, but like I said, yeah. yeah. Well, all right. So if you could go back, more about you. Um, if you could go back and talk to your twenty or twenty five year old self. You know, what would you what would you say? I ask myself that question now that I'm getting a few gray hairs. So, you know. Yeah. What do you what do you mean there a little better? Well, uh, okay. so how old are you now, father? I am 68. All right. All right. 69 tomorrow. Oh, happy birthday. All right. So go back to, you know, you as a young man, 20, you know, before your conversion, perhaps now knowing what you know and just share your wisdom with your with your younger self what would you tell i mean i would tell my 20 year old version of connor gallagher all kinds of things okay uh what would you tell yourself uh well what i've been saying really i don't i mean if i had a 20 year old here that was pretty goofy um i tried to get him back I tried to get him to read a few healthy literature that would show him, give him a taste for something beautiful. You know, Willa Cather, Secret Unset, good literature that has high ideals that could touch him and then go from there. Um, yeah, that'd be, yeah, just, and to sh- little by little, show him there are beautiful things in this world that is not, and there is a, nature that's beautiful if we enter into it that is an um it's our our artificial deviated type things that have made us give a bad picture of tradition and customs and community life family life those are the real riches to teach them that little by little which i could have used yeah 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 so yeah. No, no, that's 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 beautiful. And, I, you know, as a homeschooling dad, I'm always trying to remind myself that, you know, just teaching my kids just how to read great books, how to appreciate the beauty of whether it's imagination or nature, which is almost two sides of the same coin in a lot of ways, you know. Um, so it's, it's the basic stuff in life that brings that the greatest brand. joy. And we are the ones that complicate the heck out of it. So the the Dr. Quinn, who was the head of IHP and really found it, the Intermediate Program, he said, all we do is just point out primary beauties, you know, to, to, as if they're looking for the first time, the stars, you know, family love, just anyway, that's what they try to do. That's where that's where we begin. And that's where we end too, really, you know, these primary beautiful things. So like you're saying, go no, ahead. no, it's a it's it's a it's a beautiful idea. And, you know, I, I find that when my wife and I are successful parents, I mean, success, you know, for lack of a better word, it's, it's usually because we just allow God and nature to take its course and we don't do anything stupid to get in the way. And it's when we overcomplicate things with too many activities, too many sports, too much TV, over, overcomplicated curriculum and homeschool, too much activity. Uh, it's when we do, you know, going to the store too often to get, you know, a gallon of milk or a loaf of bread. I mean, just overcomplicating everything. Uh, we're really just doing something that's unnatural, you know. And so it's God put in our nature this ability to be joyful and and, and loving and, and to experience beauty at every stage of, of nature. And it's it's just us that seem to get in the way. But anyway, um, uh, um you, at some point in the future, uh, you have a book coming out with us at TAN, um, and it has something to do with uh, sacred silence. Now, um, you know, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you envisioned there. You know, obviously, we live in a very noisy world, um, but talk, talk to us about uh, why a Benedictine uh, might have something to say to the world about silence and how it's how sacred. I think he might, uh, um, yeah. So I hope to really, uh, as I've been a Benedictine, I've been a Benedictine for over 46 years. So uh, it'll be a Benedictine book, whether I want it or not. I mean, you know, whether I plan it or not, that's what I am. And I think um, t- two or three things fundamental things about a Benedictine. 
um, like I was talking about, let's see, well, recollection. So interior silence. So we're not dispersed on all sorts of, you know, whims and images and things that we can really think, which implies somewhat getting away from social media, et cetera. There's just, it's a miracle otherwise, if you could have any recollection with a cell phone in your hand and whatever, I think. Um, so that part of managing life, the retreat from the world, which we do radically, you might say, but anyone can and needs to do it some to discipline these things so they can build up an attention to be able to listen, listen to God's word, listen to what he's saying through events, through nature, through your friendships, to be able to listen there. So this kind of interior silence, which is for um, divine silence, being able to enter into his mystery, to gaze, to understand some about his love, about his beauty, things that are above words. We can we need words and thoughts to get close. And then kind of, that's what you enter into kind of a contemplation there where you're just gazing you're beyond words, but you have a hold of a real reality. So I think a Benedictine has something to say there about both sides, this interior silence, which is for entering into God's silence. Mm. Okay, basically. Entering into God's silence. That's a, a really beautiful concept there. So that's that's great. Well, look, uh, and, and just to wrap this up, um, maybe it's just recapping everything you've talked about, but uh, you've given us so much wisdom and, and things to think about. What, were, what are your parting words to our audience, um, tying back into the, the Benedictine perspective on, on what the Benedictine way of life and St. Benedict has to offer this world? You know? um, by the way, I, I'm sorry, I want to mention Tan's name actually is St. Benedict Press. You know, that's our real name of our company. And, okay. and uh, I didn't know. Uh, if could. Yep. And so Tan, Tan is really a DBA of St. Benedict Press LLC. And we named our company that a number of years ago in honor of the monks at uh, Belmont Abbey Monastery in Belmont, North Carolina. Uh, and our family's been very, very close with them for, for, for generations now. Um, so, you know, I've always had this incredible appreciation for what the Benedictine, you know, way ha had to offer every era that the world will go through. So um, just, uh, this is near and dear to my heart. It's it's really the name of our company. Everyone knows us as Tan, obviously, but. It's really I thought St. Benedict was a part of Tan, so I'm glad to hear the exact little bit. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, just parting words. Give us some Benedictine wisdom for these uh, all these listeners who are gonna be seeing this on YouTube or listening to it in their car, because Father, they are not in the peaceful, tranquil monastery walls. They are driving to soccer practice and going to the grocery store and fighting the the monster of technology and noise and chaos and anxiety coming at them. So give them a little bit of hope and peace here in, in conclusion. Okay. <laughs> um, I just go with our mottos of, of official, they're not official, but Benedictine that we need to look at. Pox, right? Peace to realize the importance of that and do what we can. Now, the details, another ball game, but don't go towards what gets you worried and anxious, but keep, anyway, towards the more fundamental beauties that we've been, we mentioned before, Mr. Gallagher. Peace, the lean that way, that's where God works. They, that's an old monastic axiom. God works in peaceful souls. Peaceful, that's kind of, um, the Cistercians said things like that. Our goal is to find, is to put peace in our souls and then God will do his work. So peace. And then I think the other unofficial uh, motto of Benedictine life, labora et ora, this aura, God, and also con contemplation, spiritual things, high things, and then contact with reality, labora, you know, make as, as much as possible anyway, you know, if you dig a garden or whatever, or getting out in the park, anything you can do and get in contact for your, whole being is so it is pacifying the sounds of nature are pacifying and then good work so i'd also add the uh, motto of the humanities program i talked about at ku may they be born may they be born in wonder that was the motto for their 
yeah, so for your children and for yourselves to trust reality, trust God, trust the human heart and mind that we will, you know, beauty, there is something beyond this beauty. There is wonder about God. These, these little signs God gives us in the world, beauty particularly, friendships, to follow them, to wonder about God, his beauty. I would say. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Father. Well, look, I'm going to ask our listeners to say a prayer for you and for uh, Clear Creek Abbey. Go to their website, listeners, TAN fans. Go to go to Clear Creek's uh, website. Uh, I have it here. My computer shut down. It is clearcreekmonks.org, which is a pretty cool, pretty cool web uh, domain. Um, so go check them out. Donate if uh, God calls you to do so. And then in return, Father, say a prayer for our, uh, our audience, our, our readership. Okay. We've got a, a very okay. uh, dedicated uh, listener base and readership. So, um, but with that, thank you, Father, for being here. Thank and you. And uh, all the TAN fans, we'll see you next time. Thanks for being with us. God bless everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.